As you know, we're in our third week of the Sermon on the Mount series, and this series is kind of unique from other areas in the Scriptures for a couple reasons. One of those reasons is that Jesus, when he starts the Sermon on the Mount, he takes a seat. And what you got to realize is in those days as a rabbi, if you took a seat, it was like a position of authority. In fact, it was common in the synagogue that when the rabbi sat down, everybody else would stand. And so just because he's sitting, don't think that he's just chilling and taking it easy. He's in authority. It's very similar to someone sitting on a throne, only he's sitting on a mountain. And so it's kind of a flex of almost being a boss in a sense. And so don't take the fact that Jesus is sitting down as being, oh, he's being casual about all this. Some scholars would say the Sermon on the Mount is the manifesto for the kingdom of God. That if they were to put out like a document saying, hey, this is what we're all about. Kind of a resistance as the kingdom of God being countercultural. That the Sermon on the Mount would be the manifesto of what we're all about as far as being different. Tolstoy said this about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if every nation adopted its principles, we'd never have war again. And so this is something that's got a lot of impact and potential, but it really only works if we apply it. The word will work if you work it in your life. Otherwise, it's just good thought and philosophy. But we want to bring it to real life. And that's what I think Jesus was doing when he sat down and he had his disciples and he had the crowd around him. The whole purpose of Christ's coming was to take all of that God stuff and bring it into our hearts and write it on our hearts and really change us from the inside out. And so last week, Pastor Trish kind of challenged us to be salty. In fact, uh, a football team in the NFL, they wear a shirt that says, be salty. And it has a different connotation, you know, in the world now. And my, the term I want us to think about today is last week was salty. I want to think today about squashing the beef. And if you know what beef is, beef is not just the Arby's ad in the 80s as to where's the beef or whatever that ad was. It's not just about, we're not talking about food or animals. Beef in this day and age, if you, talk to, if you went to the Rock Island High School and you asked a random kid, hey, what's beef? They would say beef is when you've got something going on with someone else that's like conflict. If I got beef with someone, it's a conflict. We're not getting along. We have an issue. And so I want you to think about last week was be salty. This week is squash the beef, okay? So just as a precursor. Now, we have lots of examples of beef in our world and in history. Back in 2004, there was a basketball game in Detroit, Michigan, at the Palace of Auburn Hills. And there, the game was pretty much over, and there's about 40 seconds left, and there was a hard foul that happened. And the teams kind of got into it, but then they kind of went their separate ways. The referees separated them, and everything was really cool until a fan threw a beer about 40 feet and hit Ron Artest on the back of the head. And then everything that had been calmed down, the beef had been squashed. But all of a sudden, someone escalated it. And next thing you know, players were going into the stands and punching fans. Fans were coming onto the floor and fighting players. And nearly 180 games were suspended and $11 million in fines were ushered out. All because people made decisions to escalate the beef instead of squashing the beef. And there are times in our lives every day where things are presented to us and we can either escalate them and intensify the beef or the hatred or the intensity or we can squash it. Now, sometimes basketball doesn't connect with everybody and that might be too recent for some people, but there's other beefs in history that we can look at to learn from about what not to do. The malice at the palace is one of those examples of what not to do. But there's another one from 1863. The Hatfields and McCoys. These two families that 
kind of were on the West Virginia, Kentucky lines. You're talking like Civil War era right at the end of that. And these families would go on a generational run of beef. And it all started because of one stupid thing. This, this feud would have 60 victims, up to 18 dead bodies, multiple arrests, one public hanging, all because, of, you know how it started? Because someone's pig wandered off into the stream and swam down to the other property line and they took possession of the pig that wasn't theirs. And they disputed whose pig it was. That was the start of generational beef that had 60 victims and up to 18 bodies. How foolish can we be? No wonder Jesus is on the mountain sitting down trying to get us right. You know? So let's not take this lightly. In fact, you can go back earlier in God's word and see the first beef, the first anger, the first pettiness that kind of gets escalated and out of control. Let's get some backstory before we dive into the Sermon on the Mount text. We have Genesis 4. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought the fruits of his soil as an offering to the Lord. Abel also brought the first of his flock as an offering. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was what? Cain was angry. And his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Wow. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. He's telling him ahead of time. Like you can escalate this. You can take that anger and act the wrong way. And sin's hope, sin's rooting for that. Sin, sin is pulling for you to do that. There's a, there's a whole cheerleading team of, on the sin side saying, let's go, escalate, escalate the beef. But you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And we have the first person that really acts out of anger in the Bible, the first murder in the Bible, the first escalation of beef to the destruction of their very brother. And so when Jesus takes the seat on the mountain, these people understand this concept. And these people have beef. They, they're a people that have been oppressed and been enslaved and have been dying for political victory and political leadership and someone to be a savior. So they're used to conflict. They're used to escalation. They, it's kind of wired in them. And so let's dive into the text. Here's Jesus talking. He says, you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. You see, Jesus calls us to squash the beef. But here's what you gotta realize. Some of these people, if they had gone to the temple they might have traveled three hours or up to three days to get there. I'm not talking about you drove to church and before worship service, 
You know, he's saying, sell your beef. That's pretty convenient, you know? He's saying, if you're, if you're at the temple with a sacrifice and you traveled three days there, you're better off leaving that thing there and driving three days back by camel or whatever it is and making it right. My goodness. He's saying this is important. And we, we probably live in a much more convenient age than back then. And I'd say it's probably more convenient for us instead of just, we're, we tend to just put it under the rug and forget about it, any beef we deal with. The scholar N.T. Wright says this, and what, what you'll see real quick, look at the Hatfields and the McCoys, if you look at the malice of the palace, you'll see this kind of domino effect where, oh, you do me wrong, I do you wrong. And then you escalate. You do me even more wrong. I do you even more wrong. And now I'm just trying to win. I don't give a rip about how you feel. I'm just trying to win because I'm right. And you can be right and still be wrong. If you damage that relationship, if you do your brother dirty, it's not honoring to the kingdom way of life. And too many times we let things that are insignificant, like a, a pig crossing the river, put us in a world of hurt for generations to come. And here's how he right describes that whole back and forth process. He says, part of the tragedy of all of this is that people take their public anger back into the home. We know this ourselves. The executive whose boss just shouted at him goes back to his own office and shouts at the secretary. Then the secretary goes home and shouts at the children. Then the children shout at the cats. If part of human maturity is learning how to recognize your anger and deal with it before it gets out of control, we have to conclude that most of us are not very mature. Because I'm going to be right at all costs. And it's tough when someone does you dirty here and you have this on you. And the thing is, it's so easy to just pass that along. But as kingdom people, we're called to something different. We're called to be beef squashers. We're not called to escalate. And when I refer to these things, I'm referring to personal relationships. People that we come into contact with on a daily basis. People that are in our lives, maybe even family members. And how, how some of us as Christ followers can just cut someone out of our lives and say, I'm never dealing with them again. They were wrong. And yeah, I might have added to it or escalated it to it, but you know, it's not worth the trouble. And instead of reconciling and getting in the mix and doing what I'm called to do and squash the beef, I'd rather just cut them out altogether, save myself the trouble. But that's not what the Sermon on the Mount tells us to do. And T. Wright goes on to say this. It almost seems impossible as we read Matthew. We discover that our natural question, how can people possibly do what he says, is eventually answered. Jesus himself refused to go the way of anger. Instead, he took the anger of his enemies within Israel and of Israel's enemies, the Romans, onto himself. And he died under its load. From that point on, reconciliation is not simply an ideal we strive for. It's an achievement, an accomplishment, which we in turn must now embody. It's not just an ideal. This is not for somebody else. This is not, it would be nice if we did X, Y, Z. This is, we need to be this in real life. And so many times in the Christian life, we get these teachings and these instructions and we think, that would be great, but we live in the real world. But Jesus is sitting on the mountain in a position of authority, saying this is the kingdom way of living. It doesn't make sense to the world. The eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth thing does make sense to the world. It's a life of grace. And it's a, it's a life 
You know, Jesus didn't talk to just talk to talk. Jesus didn't just say, hey, squash the beef. Get along with each other. Reconcile with your brother. He didn't just say that and then have beef with a bunch of people. You know what I mean? Look at his life. Shoot. What is the cross? The cross is him squashing our beef. Our separation between us and the Father through the the fall of man. It's Jesus squashing our beef. It's taking all that beef on himself. It's saying, I'm going to reconcile you to the Father. The cross was all about that. And what did he say while he's getting killed? Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Meanwhile, the soldiers are gambling for his clothes by throwing dice. Man. He practices what he preaches. He's squashing beef. Somebody say, man, look at that, look at that guy up there. He's taking a big L. But it's the ultimate victory. It's kingdom way of doing things. And now flashback, even before the cross, we have another malice in the palace type situation. In the garden, then the men step forward, sees Jesus, arrested him. This is when Judas kisses him and betrays him. One of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. So this is after the Sermon on the Mount. So this guy might have been on the mountain with them. This guy in the posse that's with Jesus' inner circle, he might have been in the Sermon on the Mount and heard the instructions. Like, hey, squash beef. Hey, don't escalate. If you have an issue with your brother, reconcile. And here, when it gets hot and heavy, and Jesus is getting betrayed, the sword comes out and it's chopping off ear time. You could say epic fail. I can, I can just imagine Jesus being like, dude, you read the Sermon on the Mount. Don't you get this? But we react out of anger, and I got to have it now. I got to have it my way now. I got to win now. But what does Jesus say? He says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword, Hatfields and McCoys. Do you think I cannot call my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? You see, being gentle is not being weak. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is strength restrained. Which means I might be in a position to destroy my brother or sister with retaliation but I'm strong enough to be gentle. And it's not saying I'm weak. It's saying, you know, I'm strong. I can obliterate you. But I refuse to escalate because the kingdom living calls me to something different. I do like how Jesus does kind of flex saying, hey, I could. I could if I needed to, but that's not what I'm calling you to. We saw that with Cain and Abel, where that goes. That's not what he's calling. The kingdom is not that. We're not trying to get into this tit for tat back and forth to destroy the humanity. That's not what his kingdom is. And isn't it funny, just 10 verses ago in Matthew, before the Sermon on the Mount portion that we're in, we have Jesus saying this, Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. What does your life look like? How are your relationships? Is it full of drama and beef and escalation? And sure, they're all the problem, not you. Right? But generally, we kind of add to it a little bit, if we're honest. Or sometimes we do got beef and it's all us. Maybe just out of preference. But God calls us to be peacemakers, to be beef squashers. And there's probably nothing better than being called a child of God. 
You see, last week we were called to be salty, and this week we're called to squash the beef. It's kingdom living. And that's tough to hear sometimes. Man, it sounds like I'm going to be a punk and I'm going to be losing all the time. But if you look at the life of Jesus, it's a life of victory. It's being strong enough to be gentle. It's knowing who the win, who's won the battle already. You know, it's Father's Day today. Uh, I was fortunate enough to do prison ministry for four years. And in my prison ministry time, I sat down with dozens of young men who some were doing juvenile life because they made one bad decision in a moment of anger. And that moment of anger had jeopardized the rest of their life because they had to have it their way in that one moment of anger. And the amount of regret that they wish they could just go back and squash the beef. And in a day and age where our culture often lacks fathers, many people, including young men, confuse anger for courage. And I see a lot of young men, they're trying to be brave and courageous. And they don't really know what that means, so they just they settle for, just, I want to be angry. And that's a tough motivation to get anything of value done in your life. But true courage pursues reconciliation. True courage pursues reconciliation. It's valuing the relationship more than my need to be right. I'm willing to squash the beef, even if I have a gripe. Because in the kingdom of God, it's better that we be unified and together and reconciled than for me just to get my way. Now, on this Father's Day, I figured I'd close with a Father's Day story that really exemplifies this in my life. And and, and this, this image, there's a term called bury the hatchet. And that, you could really throw that back to times when in tribes, Native American tribes might be battling, and to come to some kind of peace, they might bury the hatchet, or they might go and smoke a peace pipe and come to an agreement, that, hey, we're not going to fight anymore. We're going to end this beef. So I really feel like the Sermon on the Mount is really about, hey, there's going to be times in life you just got to bury the hatchet. And this can happen in all kinds of ways and all kinds of relationships. For me, it was when I was about 11 years old, and there had been a history of our home, in our home where my brother would do something stupid and I would get spanked for it. And I'd had enough. It started in East Lake, Ohio, when my brother took a razor, took my dad's razor some weekend, and he was probably seven years old. And he went into the bathroom and he decided to shave the toilet cover that was fluffy red. And he just shaved the toilet cover. And I'm like, Andy, what are you doing? He's like, eh, let's see what happens. <laughs> well, cute. But when dad gets home, it's not going to be cute. And sure enough, dad gets home. And it's, guys, get in here. What's this all about? And all of a sudden, Andy doesn't know what happened. I don't know. What I, I don't know. What happened? Well, in our house, the policy was this. If someone didn't come clean, everybody got it, right? That was the rule. And so we got lined up and we just got, now we didn't get spanked with a belt. My dad tore off the wooden door trimming off of the door with nails in it and turned the nails back and we got cracked with that piece of wood. If you came up off your knees, you got two more. So I got my whipping for something my brother did. You talk about beef. I wasn't just mad at my brother, I was mad at my dad too. Fast forward about six years. And sure enough, new story, same people. 
Something happens at the house. I had nothing to do with it. Boys, get down here. Who did X, Y, Z? And I knew my brother did it. And here it is, six years later, he's still not talking about this. No idea. I know. I know what happened. I didn't do it. We both got punished. Now I'm like 11 years old. And this had been kind of happening three or four times. And this was my last straw. I am done with this. I am done with my brother. I'm done with my dad. I'm not even talking to them anymore. And I go up to my room about 9.30 at night, and I lock my door, and I go to bed, and I say, I'm done with everybody. I can't deal with these people. My brother's getting me in trouble. My dad's spaming me for stuff I don't do. That's it. I'm out. I just want justice. I've been done wrong. These people don't know what they're doing to me. You can imagine how frustrating that was. I did nothing wrong. I get spanked, and I didn't even get the joy of seeing my brother get in trouble. And I go to my bed, and I am furious, and I lay down, and I turn and face the wall. And I say, that's it. I'm just cutting myself off from these family members of my life. About five minutes later, I start hearing the creak of the steps. And I'm faking I'm asleep. Don't you come up here and talk to me. Apparently my brother confessed to whatever it was. Convenient. I already got spanked. Great. I feel much better. I'm glad Andy confessed. Beautiful. Prodigal son, you came home. You, that's great. That you, but you left, and you got me spanked in the process. And sure enough, my lights are off. I'm faking asleep. And I'm furious, and that door opens, and I see the light cast the shadow of me on the wall. And my dad creeps over, and I, I can sense he's behind me at my bedside. And he goes, Jamie. And I'm awake. I'm not, I'm not responding. Jamie. And my eyes want this dude to leave. You unjust spanker. And he wouldn't leave. He grabbed my shoulder and he started shaking me. Jamie. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. And I turn around and I say, and I, act, and I act like I'm asleep. I'm like, yeah, what, well, dad, what, what, what's going on? I'm playing it cool like it didn't bother me. Like it didn't bother, I'm acting like it didn't bother me enough that I was fake sleeping. Like, dad, you're not, you can't get in my head. I'm, I'm, I'm asleep, sound as a baby. But of course, I wasn't. And he kneeled down at my bedside. And he said, Jamie, your father punished you today for something you didn't do. And that's wrong. Will you forgive me? In that moment, my dad, even though he was an authority over me, he humbled himself. And he realized, I value my relationship. with my son more than being right or saying, hey, it don't matter, I'm dad. He valued the relationship with me more than any win in the argument or authority flex. And he acknowledged that what he did was wrong. And he asked me, will you forgive me? And when he did that, all that heart of stone and all that bitterness and all that anger melted away. And I said, sure, Dad, I forgive you. And he hugged me. And we were reconciled in that moment. And that's the kingdom way of living. That's the kingdom way of living. That's what God's calling us to. It's not always easy. It doesn't always feel good, especially early. Especially if you get spanked for something you didn't do. But at the end of the day, when you get reconciled and God's kingdom moves, it's something the world doesn't quite understand because the world is at your door begging you. Sin is begging you to give in to the beef. 
Give in to the escalation. And here's Jesus saying, hey, there's another way. Let's be peacemakers. Let's squash the beef. Let's bury the hatchet. As Rhea plays, I'm going to pray for us. And if there's, if there's something in your life that God's just kind of brought to your attention, maybe there's some beef you've been holding on to. Maybe it's something petty and stupid. And you've been holding on to that for a while and you just want to give that over to God. I'm just going to say there's freedom in this place to do that today. And sometimes it's got to start in you first. It might be something you buried a long time ago. It might be something that's just tough or someone did you wrong or someone did you wrong and you got them back and gave them twice back what they did to you. God's kingdom calls us to a different way. He calls us to squash beef. It's not always easy, but you know what? It's a better, it's a better way. And there's going to come a day where we're going to be in that kingdom full time. And he's going to make all things new. There'll be no more beef. There'll be no more hospitals. There'll be no more prescriptions. There'll be no more human error. But until that time, we can have just a glimpse of his kingdom in our lives. And the Sermon on the Mount is a great way to get that glimpse of his kingdom in our daily lives. So as we pray, open up your mind and heart to his spirit and allow him to heal that in you first. And if there's something you want to reconcile, Father's Day is not a bad day to do that. Let's pray.